Right, we begin. Uh, I want to introduce John Downs here. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, Natasha Young, remember she was here not too long ago in the back, and she's one of the chaplains over at uh, 1200 downtown in the jail. And John is uh, the chaplain over at 701 where I go. And so he is here today with us, with our friend Stephen. And uh, so it's good to have you. John, you know, you know how in our government they're trying to get people in key places of power to change things. Somebody said recently that George Soros is funding uh, Campus Crusade. My wife was looking to donate to them, and when she read their doctrinal statement on gender neutrality now, that they're pushing on the college campuses through Christians, we're done with that. But see, they get in these key areas where they have influence. And my point is, um, when you go to these jail ministries, um, your chaplain's very important. What they believe, their doctrinal statement, what do they... And John and I see eye to eye on so much. Um, I'm sure there's something we disagree on. I don't know what it is, but... (laughs) But he's been a great brother in Christ for so many reasons and his doctrinal purity. And so it's been wonderful to go over there and... um, um, Oh, hold on. I know what it's doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm parting it differently, so. Um, John is so trusted with me that if I drop dead of a heart attack, you just wheel me off and let him finish the message, okay? Or if I get raptured and y'all are left behind, then he could still do it. <laughs> Hold on, I'm still having this. Let me see. We'll just have to skip that slide today. It's not liking that slide. Um, Well, with all that said, let's turn to Revelation 4. Obviously, we'll be in verse 5 today. Now, you can see why I chose Isaiah 6, 1 through 5 as our intro. Very similar scene. Angels saying, holy, holy, holy. Um, I will teach Isaiah 6, 1 through 5 as an addendum to Revelation 4. That's my goal probably in two to three weeks. Um, I'm debating whether to teach the whole chapter. It's only like 12 verses, I think. It's very short. But I timed it out. It's a two-hour message, so... My point is I just want to highlight the worship of God in heaven. You know, I've said before, sometimes when you go to church, if you're not browbeating people over sin, it wasn't a message. But what about just a message on worshiping God, forgetting who we are, just who is God? I mean, that song that y'all chose today, perfect for our message today. Holy, 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 one of my favorite hymns and very apropos for our, our subject And sometimes we need to get our eyes off of self and on the Lord. And all these descriptions of these angels and the 24 elders, there's a lot of debate on who they are exactly. uh, But don't lose sight of the worship that's going on in heaven and the totality of it, as opposed to what's going on down here in this world, the devil's world, especially when you read Revelation 6 through 19, when Satan is unleashing all his power on this earth and the horrible things that will happen, including almost two-thirds of the earth dying within seven years. So um, I'm confident the pre-trib rapture will rescue us from that, um, which we've already studied. But, well, with all that said, let's just go ahead and read um, Revelation 4. It's a short chapter. Let's read it and then come back and start looking at things. Verse 1, after these things, John says, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after these things. We know from chapter 1, this voice that was speaking to him previously was Jesus Christ when he appeared to him on the island of Patmos. He says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one seated on the throne. That's, I think, God the Father. Compare that to Daniel 7, uh, 13 and 14, and you'll see the Ancient of Days was on the throne. Jesus will then come up to him, get the kingdom from him. We know in our text in chapter 5, Uh, Jesus will approach the one on the throne, the Father, and take the seven-sealed scroll. So he's the lamb slain who takes the scroll. Verse 3, 
He who was seated was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And therefore, I'm sorry, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the, 24, around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders seated, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And I argue that that's the church in heaven, 24, representing the whole from First Chronicles 24, when the priesthood was numbered in 24 to represent the entire priesthood. So I think these, this is a representation of the church in heaven before the tribulation. So they're white, they have white garments. I think that supports that. Golden crowns on their heads would be rewarded saints because believers who walk faithfully get crowns. Verse 5, out from the throne come flashes of lightnings and sounds and peals of thunder And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion. So notice the simile using like or as, like a lion. The second creature, like a calf. The third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them had six wings full of eyes around and within. Day and night, they did not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who, uh, I'm sorry, who was, and who is, and who is to come. So the eternal God. So clearly, holy, holy, holy picks up on that Isaiah 6 passage. And when the uh, living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him seated on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who is seated on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed And they were created. So you have this creature, creator distinction. God is the creator of all things. Genesis 1, 1, that makes all things creation. And there's only one true God, the creator of all that is to be worshipped. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, this passage. Bless it to our hearts, just the reading of it. And as we go through it, may the Holy Spirit give us guidance as to the interpretation of what we find therein. We'll ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, verse 5, which is on the slide. It says, Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there, was set, there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, the first part of verse 5 says, Out of the throne comes flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. Does this remind you of any scripture, anything in the Bible, in the Old Testament? Yeah, Exodus 19, when the Jews go to Mount Sinai, um, the glory of God manifests in such a way with similar language. Um, I'm not saying it's the same event, but you just see that was such a majestic um, expression of who God is, this, just seeing the glory and, and the similar language here just to show the glory of God. Well, it's in this scene in heaven. So I think um, this is describing God's majesty, his power, and also his impending judgment about to come from him to the earth. So you can compare this to Revelation 8, 5, 11, 19, 16, 18, which we will uh, get to eventually. But think of the words of Job 38 verse, I'm sorry, Job 37 verse 4, After it, a voice roars, he referring to God, he thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. So the glory, John is seeing this vision and the glory of God in that throne room. Uh, Verse 5 also describes seven lamps, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are... specifically the seven spirits of God. Does anyone have in their translation the sevenfold spirit? Does everyone have the seven spirits? Well, the, the Greek says that. The word spirits is plural with the word hepta for seven. Um, so we got to talk about that a little bit. What is or what are the seven spirits of God? Does anyone remember where we first encountered this? 
Well, in Revelation. Because you may go, I saw it in Isaiah 11. I saw it in Zechariah 4. I think you'd be right. But remember back in 1, 4, and 5. Now, and, and remember back there, I think it's a reference to the triune Godhead in, in these two verses. Jesus appears to John on the island of Patmos. But it says early in the chapter, starting in Revelation 1, 4, from him who is and who was and who is to come. I think that's the Father. Of course, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's all part of the eternal triune Godhead, but it's a reference specifically to the Father. And from the seven spirits who are, bef- who are before his throne, I think that's the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, now you've got God the Son. You've got all three members of the Trinity here. The faithful witness, the firstborn of or from among the dead ones, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So we pause there definitely to talk about Christ, the faithful witness. What does it mean he's firstborn? It doesn't mean he's the firstborn of the creation, as Scripture says. He's the firstborn, the one with the place of privilege above all his creation that he created. And then we talked about him being the king of kings, lord of lords. So we traced the kingdom for a couple of sermons, I think, back then. But clearly you have the reference to the seven spirits of God in that text. Um, Now, the word spirit, go back to Revelation. You can go to either passage, but if you want to go back to chapter 4, you have the same Greek here, but the word spirit makes it a little more challenging because the Greek word pneuma can refer to an attitude, like a spirit. It can refer to an evil spirit, can refer to an angel. It can refer to the human spirit that's alive in a born-again Christian. It can also refer to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you have the word holy with the word pneuma, then you have no mistaking that it's the Holy Spirit, but sometimes you don't. And many times we're told to walk by the Spirit or so forth without the word holy there. It's clearly the third person of the Trinity. I think it is here too, Um, but some do interpret the seven lamps, which are the seven spirits of God, since it is a plural there, they say it refers to literally seven angelic beings and maybe relate those to those angels that pour out the judgments in the seven, it's sevens, right? Seven, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Dr. Constable said the wrath of God proceeds from this throne. Seven burning lamps probably picture divine preparedness for battle against wickedness. Seven spirits of God, and he says, namely, the seven principal angels of God will carry out this judgment. And I think Dr. Constable is a great scholar, and uh, that's one view that some have. I personally think this text is dealing with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God. And if that's the case, why does it then say seven spirits? Why seven of them, or why seven? And then why the plural of pneuma uh, if there's only one Holy Spirit? Now, that's the big question. So some scholars see this as the Holy Spirit in his sevenfold being. Some even say his sevenfold character. That is the Holy Spirit's perfect, complete, and universal being. What is the number of completion in the Hebrew Bible? In other words, the number seven. So some see it as the Holy Spirit and His sevenfold being who is the same spirit of the seven churches, therefore over the entire universal church. Remember, Revelation 2 and 3 speaks to the seven churches. And at the end of the address of every one of the seven churches, what do you have? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So the the Holy Spirit is over the totality of the body of Christ. And actually indwells the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 says he indwells the body, the church, I think. And also indwells our bodies individually. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, the Holy Spirit who is in you. So within this view that they are angels, I'm sorry, that they are, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Some connect this to Isaiah 11. Let's see if it gives me the slide. It doesn't like those backgrounds. I'm going to try one more time to redo this. Isn't it threefold? Then it happens, it happened twice. Okay, good. We'll turn to Isaiah 11. (coughs) 
Some connect this sevenfold spirit or the seven spirits of God to Isaiah 11, specifically verse 2. So 700 years before Jesus came to earth, Isaiah 11 says this, verse 2, the spirit of Yahweh will rest on him. Now, we're in the context of the kingdom, so who's the king? Jesus, he'll rule the kingdom, so the spirit of God will rest on him, I think the Messiah. And notice the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge, and the, and the fear of the Lord. How many do you see here? Do you see six or seven? You got the spirit of wisdom, one. Understanding, two. Counsel, strength, knowledge, fear. At six, where's the seventh? Yeah, the Spirit of the Lord, that could be number seven. Now, some argue and say, no, 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 that doesn't work because the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. It's followed by everything else, which is appositional to that, so there's only six. I think you can go with seven, including the Spirit of the Lord is the first one. You see? Okay, so some connect it there. Dr. John Walver does. He says uh, these should be understood to represent the Holy Spirit. That's the sevenfold spirit of Revelation. These should be understood to represent the Holy Spirit rather than the seven individual spirits or angels with the concept of the sevenfold character of the Spirit found in Isaiah 11, 2, and 3. Um, others connect the sevenfold Spirit to Zechariah 4 because of the similarities to Revelation 1, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 6. So those are on the slide for you. Let's read those. Okay, verse... 4 of chapter 1, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Well, they're before the throne in Revelation 4, 4, 5. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And then when you get to 5, 6, notice what it adds into this. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. So if he's standing as if slain, his slaying was on the cross, right? Now he's standing, so what is he? He's resurrected. He's alive. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now he brings this spirits of God sent out into all the earth. That's a Zechariah 4 thing, no doubt. So you got those at least for a second, um, the, the language of Revelation 1, 4, 4, 5, and 5, 6. Now turn to Zechariah 4. Um, how many allusions are there to the Old Testament and Revelation? You've got to know your Old Testament to interpret Revelation. I'm highlighting the high points that connect to our verses, Zechariah 4, 2, 4, 6, and 4, 10. But let's read the text. It's, a, it's not a long chapter, so... Did y'all go to Zechariah 4? I don't hear pages turning because I think everyone's on phones now, but what did Clay Ward say at the conference? I'm looking for an app that when you do this on your phone, it makes the sound of a page. <laughs> He's like me. He likes the sound of Bible pages turning. But again, Zechariah is a post-exilic prophet. So when the Jews go... Excuse me, they go into Babylon 70 years, they come out, they go back to the land. God will send prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And who will rebuild the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians? Under what authority? What's the man's name? Starts with a Z. Zerubbabel. And he's mentioned in this chapter. So verse 1, the angelic messenger who had been speaking with me then returned and woke me. This has nothing to do with being woke. As a person is wakened from sleep, he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I, I see and behold a lampstand of all gold with its bowls on the top of it and its seven lamps on which there are seven spouts belonging to each lamp which are on top of it. So this is describing the menorah that the Jews put in the tabernacle and then in the temple. 
There are also two olive trees beside it, one on the right of the receptacle and the other on the left. So there's some additional things described about the menorah here in what he sees. Then I asked the messenger, messenger who spoke with me, what are these, sir? And he replied, don't you know what these are? So I responded, no, sir. Therefore, he told me these signify the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, so the governor in the post-exilic community of Israel. And here it says, and we've quoted this verse a lot, sometimes out of context, but not by strength, not by power, but by my spirit. Do you have capital S or small? See, that's, I think, the Holy Spirit. Says the Lord who rules over all, so God's sovereign. What are you, you great mountain? Because of Zerubbabel, you will become a level plain. And he will bring forth the temple capstone with shoutings of grace, grace, because of this. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me as follows. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this temple, and his hands will complete it. So it was destroyed by the Babylonians. They go back to rebuild under Ezra, Nehemiah, and it's Zerubbabel's temple. Then you will know that the Lord who rules over all has sent me to you. Again, a reference to the sovereignty of Yahweh. For who dares make light of small beginnings? Now here, doesn't this sound like revelation? These are the seven eyes, or excuse me, these seven eyes will look joyfully on the ten tablet in Zerubbabel's hand. These are the eyes of the Lord which constantly range across the whole earth. Now back up a little. What did we just see at the bottom of Revelation 5, 6 here? The seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. There's got to be a connection there. So, Dr. Robert Thomas, excellent two-volume commentary on Revelation, says, quote, Zechariah 4.2 speaks of the seven lamps, Revelation 4.5 in comparison, that are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the whole earth. This has close similarity to John, John sent out to all the earth in Revelation 5.6. The prominence of the Holy Spirit's activity in the world in Zechariah 4, 2 through 10 is established by the words, not by might or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, Zechariah 4, 6. In deriving the title, John identifies the seven eyes of Zechariah with the seven spirits which belong to the Lord, Zechariah 4, 10 compared to Revelation 5, 6. These seven lamps are also synonymous with the seven spirits of Revelation 4, 5, and he in his commentary, holds that this is a reference to God the Holy Spirit. So if, and I think it's true, if the seven spirits of God refer to the Holy Spirit, then just like Revelation 1, 4, and 5, Revelation chapters 4 and 5 present a picture of the Trinity. Revelation 4, 1, and 5 did that well, and now you have a picture of the Trinity and are seen in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5. The Father seated on the throne, Revelation 4, 2 and 5, 7. The Lamb of God who is slain, now standing, Revelation 5, 6. And the Holy Spirit, Revelation 4, 5 and 5, 6. You know, we're told to worship only one true God. If we don't define God correctly, what are we worshiping then? An idol. So if the Trinity is a false carnal doctrine, then we're all worshiping an idol. If we're correct, and I think we are, what are people worshiping who deny the Trinity? Something other than the true God. And how quickly, remember the end of 1 John, the last verse of the whole book says, guard yourself from idols. But it speaks of Jesus Christ being the true God. Three times it mentions the word true, alithinos, because the opposite of the, of the genuine is the false. And so Satan wants to get us at that level, redefine God. If he does that with you, you're done. Who cares what you do? Or another thing he's really successful at is defining or teaching us the Bible's not the Word of God. If we, can agree, if we agree that the Bible's not the Word of God, then we are wasting our time. I'm up here preaching the opinions of ancient men, but I believe it's all God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. Every verb, every noun, every direct object was put where God wanted it. So all scriptures God-breathed. And we put that argument down and we worship the only true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three distinct persons and one Godhead. So I, th I see the Trinity highlighted 
uh, in Revelation pretty early on. So in the throne room of God, by application, or at least observation, all three members of the Trinity are present. Fair enough? I didn't say, do you believe it? Just trying to make the argument. Hopefully you do. I mean, that's one of the things, if you want to join this church, that's one of the central doctrines. Well, I don't believe in Jesus or the Trinity, and, but let's don't, you know, make a big deal out of stuff, right? I mean, those are the cores of the faith. You can't bend on those. <clears throat> so, go back to 4 or 5. I don't know where I had you. Are you still in Zechariah? Okay, then <laughs> let's go back to Revelation 4. So the seven lamps burning before the throne represent the fullness and perfection of the Holy Spirit. You know, I was noticing in the song, Holy, 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 only you are, what, perfect. I don't know if they're drawing on that idea, but um, God is a perfect God. And now we have seven lamps burning, which I think describes the perfection of the Holy Spirit. Again, seven being the number of completion or perfection in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible. So... This may be a little bit of a stretch, and I know you'll say it doesn't say it specifically, but here's an argument that has been proposed. John saw seven lamps before the throne, but he didn't see lamp stands. Remember, there is a difference between lamps in chapter 1 and lamp stands. But if there are seven lamps in heaven, what do lamps sit on? Lamp stands. It doesn't say they're there, but it's very safe to say, I think that there are seven lamp stands. And what were the seven lamp stands in Revelation 1? The church, the seven churches. So Revelation 1.20. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which Jesus said to John, you saw in my right hand. Oh, wait a minute, right hand? Sorry, I have my hand in my pocket. And the seven golden lamp stands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Some say pastors. I go with angels here. It's the word angelos. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the argument would go this way. The seven lamps of the Holy Spirit represent the Holy Spirit in heaven. The seven lampstands represent the seven churches, which represent the church as a whole throughout church history. The 24 elders of Revelation 4.4 represent the entire church in heaven, Therefore, the church is in heaven in Revelation 4 and 5 because the execution of the judgments of the tribulation have not started and they're about to in sequence. You see the argument of maybe saying it's possible the church is in heaven with that argument. I wouldn't put it as my primary argument, but after all those we went through, I think it may add to the case. May, as they say, strengthening the case. Okay, Revelation 4, 6 through 8. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. Now, only in your imagination, what does that look like? How beautiful must this be if God made it up there? And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Remember when Paul visited the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12? And when he came back, he says, I'm not even permitted to say it's words inexpressible. When he saw the throne room of God, uh, I mean, we get these descriptions, but what kind of slide can you put up here to even give it the weight that it's going to have when we see this? So in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. Verse 7, the first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had the face like that of a man, the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. So God is set apart and distinct from all his creation. Then he's called the Almighty. So God is omnipotent or all-powerful, who was, who is, and who is to come. So you have this past, present, future. So God is eternal and has no beginning or end. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. 
So God has no beginning or end. But back to verse 6 where John says, before the throne there was something like a sea of glass like crystal. So obviously it's just smooth like crystal. But a sea is usually turbulent, but this sea is completely, completely calm like glass. I want to read you what Dr. Constable said about this because this is difficult to interpret. Do you know what this sea of glass is exactly? Let me let you hear what he had to say and you may go, huh, maybe I need to think a little harder through this. He says the clear glass-like sea before the throne may represent the need for cleansing before approaching God. The laver, also called a sea in the Old Testament, served the need for cleansing in the Israelite tabernacle and temple. Did you know when they built the temple under Solomon, they called the laver, which was not called that in the Torah. Remember the priest had to wash in that laver before going into the tabernacle to be cleansed so he would not die? Well, when you get to 1 Kings 7.23, the laver is called the sea. S-E-A, like the ocean. Interesting. I remember first seeing that years ago going, why would they call it the sea? He says, per, um, he says, perhaps the fact that this sea is solid indicates that those who can approach God's throne have attained a fixed state of holiness by God's grace. Perhaps the sea represents the forces opposed to God's will and His people. This is what the sea symbolized in the ancient Near East. I've noticed something in the eternal state, what's missing? There's no sea, right? There's no longer any sea. But there's fresh water. So there's a lot of things you can do with this. He says this is what the sea symbolized in the ancient Near East, the the forces opposed to God's will and his people. He says John now saw these forces under God's sovereign control. The best explanation seems to be that this sea pictures some type of firmament that separates God in His holiness and purity from all sinful creation. Remember, and then he goes to Genesis 1-7, compared to Exodus 24, 10 and 11, 1 Kings 7, 23, Psalm 104, 3, Ezekiel 1, and 26. I think Dr. Robert Thomas took that firmament view. So didn't God separate the waters from the waters with a firmament? So now there's a separation there. So you may say, well, that just confused me even more. Uh, but when you start looking at people using Scripture to interpret the symbolism, this one come, becomes a little challenging. Uh, but, so do we have any other Scripture with the sea of glass? And if you find one, I want it, okay, if I don't show you today. By the way, I haven't memorized the entire Bible cover to cover. I don't know it all simultaneously. So it is possible that you may have a verse that can help me, right? Well, it does show up in this book. Revelation 15, verse 2. Now, Revelation 15 is a chapter dealing with the preparation of the final series of judgments. You have the seals, seven, trumpets, seven, and then the seven bowls or seven vials, V-I-A-L-S. So in the introduction to the seven bowls of wrath, Revelation 15, 2 says this, John speaking, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Why is it mixed with fire? What does that mean? What can fire mean? Purity. It can refer to judgment, cleansing. God is a consuming fire. Um, It can just refer to God's presence sometimes. So some have suggested mixed with fire is God's impending judgment. That would be possible because judgment's about to unfold, the worst judgments of history. Some connect this to the fiery trials of the martyrs who are now in heaven. And doesn't Peter say, don't be surprised at the fiery trials among you for your testing? Well, keep reading. That works well with the following because it says, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. So who are these people who were victorious over the Antichrist. Well, remember Revelation 13 says they did not worship his image, and then the beast will have them killed. So you walk it with obedience or in obedience to God in the tribulation, you lose your life. So what did they just go through? Trials, fiery trials, and they were victorious. So could it be a picture 
of this sea of glass, now calm, but it's mixed with fire, those who went through fiery trials? Maybe so. So you do have martyrs in the tribulation, 12, 11, 13, 15. So they're standing on the sea of glass holding harps of God. What would harps indicate? We'll deal with harps a little more later. Music. I mean, how many times in the Old Testament did they have uh, lyres and instruments, stringed instruments, harps, praising the Lord? Sometimes we make such a big deal over the instrument. I think it's what you're using the instrument for is very important. They're praising the Lord with these. So they're worshiping God in heaven after giving their lives for not conforming to the beast or the antichrist. And then you get the four living creatures. This is where we'll have to focus the rest of the time. I think these four living creatures represent angelic beings. I think they are angelic beings. And I think a special category of angels. I'll quote you, Constable, again. The four living creatures seem to be angelic beings that reflect the attributes of God. Not saying they're God in any way. He's not meaning that. They're not deity, but they reflect Him. They form an inner circle and surround the throne of God. Ezekiel 1.12. We'll get there in a minute. But they must constitute an exalted order of angelic beings. And I do think there is an order of authority in the angelic realm. They appear similar to the seraphim. Remember our opening scripture? Uh, John saw, or I'm sorry, Isaiah saw in the throne room of heaven angels with six wings called seraph, seraphim, plural, uh, which means burning ones. He says they're even more like the cherubim, Ezekiel 1.4, 9.3, and uh, 9.10. Though because of their differences, they appear to be in a class by themselves. So they look like seraphim compared to other scriptures, but they do share characteristics of the cherubim. So maybe he's arguing they're just a whole different class of angels. They appear to have judicial function. God uses them to bring judgment, right? Revelation 6.1, 6.3, 6.5, and 6.7. And to some, I'm sorry, and to some, I'm sorry, and to have some connection with animate creation because of the description of man and animals and so forth. So let's talk about these four living creatures. Now, John says they looked like this. And we get this vivid description. The first description is this. They were full of eyes in front and behind. Also, verse 8 indicates they were full of eyes. Now, he saw that they had that, but what could eyes, being full of eyes, emphasize? Omniscient, because God, you know, the, his eyes are going to and forth from all the earth. He sees all things. He's sovereign. What else can eyes maybe, eyes deal with perception? He's watching. Yeah, he's watching. We may say, don't you see? Don't you get it? Don't you see? What are we saying? Don't you perceive? So what could that also indicate? Wisdom, perception, knowledge, intelligence. So there's full of eyes front and behind. I think that symbolizes their wisdom, knowledge, and intelligence given by the Creator. Number two, um, it gives four unique descriptions of each creature. The first creature was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. Now that's some vision. Now I think this looks back to Ezekiel. Go, go, turn to Ezekiel 1. So Ezekiel would be a prophet of God that goes into the exile in Babylon. So he's that far back. Centuries before Jesus ever walked the earth. But he gets revelations from God while the Jews are in a difficult, a difficult place. And again, as we read these, and you're not sure exactly what these are or describing to perfect detail, join the club, okay? 
I mean, this is our Lord revealing things to us. And I'm comfortable with not understanding everything about God. Because once you say, I've got him figured out, you don't have the God of the Bible. You just can't get your arms around him. And my, as my problem, like Dr. Bayless said, I'm just too big in my life and God is just too small in my understanding. I just got to get him bigger and me smaller. But my problem is I'm too big and God's too small in my head. Right? Because we're too haughty. We're not, we're not just seeing the immensity of this God, his, his eternality. And, and God, you'll stand at the Grand Canyon and feel this big. What about when we read this? How small should we feel? Verse 4, as I look, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing continually and a bright light around it, and it's midst something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it were figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. See, the seraphim in Isaiah 6 have six wings. These are probably cherubim. If you study chapter 10, he keeps calling them over and over cherubim. But as Constable argued, maybe this scene in heaven in Revelation has a spe special class of angels with these four living creatures. Well, each one of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like a calf's hoof. They gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings and on their four sides were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for, as for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had a face of a lion on the right, the face of a bull on the left, the, uh, and all four had the face of an eagle. So you still see the same descriptions that we see in Revelation 4. Now turn to Ezekiel 10, which calls them cherubim, which are angelic beings, with verse 12 describing them as having eyes all around, full of eyes all around, just like the description in Revelation 4, 6. Ezekiel 10, 12, their whole body, their backs, their hands, their wings, and the wheels were full of eyes all around, Revelation 4, 6. The wheels, belonging to all, and, excuse me, the wheels belonging to all four of them. The wheels were called in my hearing the whirling wheels. And each one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. That's a difference. The second face was that of a man. The third face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. Similar to 4-7 of Revelation. Verse 15, then the cherubim rose up, angels, they are the living beings that I saw by the river Kabar, just like the four living creatures of Revelation 4. I think their cherubs are angels. You know, Satan was, is the fallen cherub, the anointed cherub. So he had a special task before a holy God before his fall. And now he's lost that relationship. He's the ruler of this world and he will be judged forever. So there are the connections in Ezekiel. Now, some suggest the descriptions and revelation of the four living creatures represent four things. The man represents the pinnacle of God's creation. The lion represents the height of the animal kingdom. The bull represents the height of the domesticated animal kingdom. The eagle represents the height of all things that fly. Um, Jeremy Thomas, who's a pastor friend of mine, years ago did a paper titled, Is the Church in Revelation 5? Here's what he said after studying this extensively. He says, traditionally, expositors have rightly identified these four living creatures as angels, not humans. I agree. They are living creatures, the Greek word zoon, which is a word that is often used of domestic or wild beasts. But here they're not properly beasts, but angelic beings. They have many eyes, he says, similar to the four living creatures depicted in Ezekiel 1, 4 through 14, 9, 3, 10, 2, and following, and so forth. And they show some resemblance to the seraphim of Isaiah 6 with their six wings. The first creature was like a lion. The lion is known as the king of the jungle and generally represents that which is most noble among animate creation. The second creature was like an ox. The ox is, what is an ox known for? Strength. 
So the ox is known for its great strength in the animate creation. The third creature had a face like that of a man. Man is the most intelligent and wise of the animate creation. And I'm going to emphasize that he is, but he's also distinct from the animate creation because man is created in the image of God. We are not an animal. I would argue the angels aren't even in the image of God. So man is the most intelligent and wise of the animate creation. The fourth creature was like a flying eagle. The eagle is the swiftest in the animate creation. Dr. Robert Thomas said, Together then the four living beings picture all animate life from the perspectives of greatest nobility, strength, wisdom, and speed. Newell says, God's designation of them gives only the number four and the fact that they are, as their four generic forms reveal, the very embodiment of created life. Thus, the, the four living creatures are real beings that represent all of animate creation. So you get them worshiping God. You get the 24 elders worshiping God, and you just get this totality in heaven of all creatures worshiping the Lord. So the third description is in Revelation 4, 8. Each of them had six wings. So the four living creatures had six wings total. Another reason I think the four living creatures are angels, not necessarily seraphim, but Isaiah 6 describes these angels, the seraphim with six wings. Again, Isaiah 6, 1 and 2. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, of course, and with the train of his robe filling the temple, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Now, a very important thing as you look at all these descriptions, just trying to get some understanding of if these are angels, what does this represent? Um. Let's never forget what they're doing, which is revealed in verse 8. So we saw the description of what they look like, but what do they do? Day and night, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So the threefold cry, holy, 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 could refer to their praise of the triune God. Some say three members of the Trinity. Others would argue it just is a repetition of or a highlight of God's majesty. I'm okay with both of those. <laughs> so the seraphim say the same thing in the presence of God. They called out to one another and they said, Kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So the sovereignty of God Obviously, he's not limited to the earth. He's omnipresent, but his glory fills the earth as well. And, and take note, it says day and night. They don't cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. So holy, holy, I'm sorry, day and night is what they call in language a merism. It's a figure of speech. You may be dirty. I'm covered from head to toe with mud. Are you really head to toe? It's just a merism saying the totality of your body. So if they say holy, holy, holy continually, day and night, that's a merism for always. Now, the angels have a, um, and a benefit that we don't. They don't need sleep. How are you all doing after the setting the clocks up? It's kind of messing you up already. We get... Our sleep off one night, we're in trouble. So they don't have that problem, so they can do this constantly. However, can you say holy, holy, holy? And I'm asking myself the same thing all day long. Or do we get so distracted that we say it once a week on Sunday when I give God my time? Is it possible to take God through your day every waking moment, even though you're doing your job and what you got to do, your, your, whatever you do for a job and make money, uh, raising your kids and all that. Can't you keep God in your mind at the same time? My mom could do 10 things at one time. She could cook, discipline us from the distance with a shoe, uh, watch TV. You know. We can do things 
have multi. I'm not a good multitasker. Now, if somebody's talking to me, I want to hear one person talk at a time. But you know what I mean? We can multitask and still keep God in our hearts all day long. Pray to Him silently as you're going through your day. How many times do you, do you pray a day and you don't even realize you're doing it, but you're talking to God? Uh, you're not necessarily on your knees with your hands like this. You're just talking to God. Does He say, no, 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 you have to be in a church on your knees? No, you can do it right wherever you are. So can we do that and have this continual praise of the Lord? You know, my problem with me is my flesh. It keeps getting in the way. When I get resurrected, I won't have that problem and I won't need sleep, right? I'll just be in a resurrection body and we'll be able to do this. But he still calls believers to worship him continually down here too. So it's something we have to concentrate on doing and make time to do and learn how to do it throughout the day. Now, I do think there are times when we need to get in a quiet place and really study and focus on God. And uh, there's definitely that time too that we need. But you can take the Lord through your day. That doesn't mean if you have a job that you set up a little study hall at your desk and study the Bible half the day on, your, on, God, on, on the time of your company and they fired you. I'm being persecuted for Jesus. No, you got fired because you're not doing your job. Um, that's why when I had Bible studies before I became a pastor, it was always at lunch. I had one at St. Luke's Medical Center. Couldn't do it any other time than lunch because the employees said, we have to do it at lunch. Well, I said, I have to do it at lunch too. Had one at my office at Standard Register for the hour. Boy, I struggled to get within the hour. Y'all know me. Boss would sometimes put his head in. Hey, Dave, you're like two minutes over. We want to keep this thing going. You don't want to have to have it closed down because you went over a minute. You know how the powers that be. But we did it on our lunch hour so it wouldn't affect work. So you get what I'm saying. So in closing, and I mean it, These, oh, I still got two minutes, right? Now, wait a minute. It's, it's now only 11 o'clock. <laughs> I'm going to use this. I hate daylight savings time. We need to get rid of it. It's not a spiritual issue, but I don't see the, uh, the need for it. And they keep saying every year they're going to get rid of it, but I'm going to take advantage of it today. We'll go another hour. <laughs> so notice the constant praise of, uh, and worship of God. And these angelic beings worship God, and I think including the Son. There's a praise of the triune God in heaven, but even God the Son is worshipped, which indicates He's God. He can't just be a creature. Why would you worship Him? So let's close with Hebrews 1. Um, You can turn there with me. We're almost in the book of Hebrews. After the book of Jude, we'll go to Hebrews And if the Lord doesn't come back for 10 years, we might be in Hebrews in that 10th year. There is so much going on in that book. But notice angels worship Christ specifically, which is, this chapter is a great argument for the deity of Christ. Throughout this book, you'll see five main warning passages to born-again Jewish believers They aren't those that had a non-saving faith or professed faith that weren't weren't really saved, as the Lordship people say. They're born-again Jewish believers. He's writing to a Jewish audience, as 1st and 2nd Peter does, as Jude does, Hebrews, and James. So he's writing to born-again believers, warning them not to defect from Christ. They've believed in Him. Why are you going to go back to your ancestral Judaism that's under God's judgment? And so he warns them in the strongest terms, don't turn from Jesus. You've believed in him, stay firm and keep your eyes focused on him. The author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross and despised the shame. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 tells them, stay focused on him. But couched in Hebrews is some of the highest Christology you will ever find. Who is Jesus? So in chapter 1, he begins with Jesus is supreme to what? To the angels. And people in the first century worshipped angels. Uh, He's superior. Chapter 3, he's superior to Moses, the great prophet. He's the greater prophet than Moses of Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. He's superior. He has a superior priesthood. The Levites were 
a Levitical priesthood. Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek. He's a king priest, and he's from Judah. So he has even a superior priesthood. On and on, the supremacy of Christ over all things, the creator of all things. So how does he argue this in chapter 1? Well, the angels even worship him. So verse 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, God the Father, speaking to us through his Son, Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things. Well, Jesus is the creator of all things, therefore sovereign over all, through whom he made the world. Verse 3, he is the, I love this, talk about the, deity of Christ. He, Jesus, is the radiance of His glory, that'd be the Father, and the exact representation of His nature or being. So is Jesus the Father? No. But is His essence equal with the Father? See, two different members of the Trinity equal deity. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the Word was with God the Father, the Word was God. Two different persons share the same glory. So he's the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of his nature. So he is God, but he's distinct because he's the Son. And he, that's Jesus, upholds all things together by the Word of his power. So in John 1, 3, Jesus created all things that exist And what does he do? He sustains all things that exist by the word of his power, including you and I. These people think they're lucky stars. Who do you think that you're above ground today? Jesus Christ. Who holds this universe together, including ourselves? Jesus Christ. See, that's worship. If you even believe that, you just worship God because you recognize him as the supreme being. You know how many people would say that's a lie? See, you're worshiping, they're denying it. They're suppressing God in unrighteousness. And he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I could spend 20 sermons on this first verse when I get there. So that's the session of Christ. He was crucified, buried, resurrected, ascended to heaven, now seated at the right hand of God. Having become as much better than the angels as he inherited a more excellent name than they. So he's supreme. For to which of the angels did he, the Father, ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Answer, none. Who did he say it to? And where did he say that? Psalm 2. Do you have a footnote, Psalm 2? That's where he's quoting. He only said it to God the Son. And again, I'll be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. Where's that? 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant. 1 6. See, if you know the Old Testament, when you read the New, it's gonna, the Holy Spirit will just fire this stuff in your mind. And I think this will insulate in our hearts that Jesus is eternal God, but a second person of the Trinity. It insulates our theology proper that we continue to worship the correct God and not a false God. That's why I will spend some time in. Hebrews 1. Then he says, and when he again brings the firstborn into the world, so Jesus is called the prototokos, which really means he has the place of privilege above all things. Because what did the firstborn, I'm sorry I'm preaching all this now, didn't the firstborn in Israel have the place of privilege? They're creatures. Jesus is the creator and he holds the ultimate place of privilege because he's the creator of all things. He's not first born in terms of coming out of a womb of a mother. When Jesus gave, or Mary gave birth to Jesus, how many mothers had given birth before? Since, since Eve, how many? Countless. So he has the place of privilege. That's the idea of first born here. Which literally in, among the Israelites, one who first came out of the womb had the place of privilege. But this is different for Jesus. Much higher So when he again brings the firstborn into the world, that's Christ, he says, the Father says, let all the angels of God worship him. In order to do that, what does Jesus have to be? God. This isn't some sort of respect or veneration. This is worship of true God. 
Isaiah 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not share my glory with another, nor give my praises to graven images. Now, we can honor our parents, things like that. That's the word to glorify. But when it comes to glorifying God, we worship Him as the living God, not simply give honor to a creature. And then in verse 7, and of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God. The Father actually calls Jesus God. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. So Jesus will rule an eternal kingdom. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. A lot of passages deal with that. I'd go to... Genesis 49.10, where it says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples. So he is to be worshipped. He has an eternal throne. And he will rule with a righteous scepter over that kingdom. Uh, Jeremiah 23.5 and 6, he will uh, act wisely, and he will rule over Israel. Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. Is that Psalm 46? Do y'all have that in your, or is it 45? 40 what? 45, 6. Okay, so 45, he looks back there, which is dealing with the kingdom. So in Hebrews 12, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What's the joy? The oil of gladness, the kingdom, right? He's going to rule in this wonderful kingdom of joy. So he endures the cross in the meantime, anticipating the kingdom. Guys, what are you getting? What are you doing in your life to get through this crazy world? Where is your focus? If you go to politics as your only focus, it's going to bury your soul, (laughs) But if you, even if you look at that, that's fine, but you've got to look at Christ through it because that's our destiny. Our destiny is not this fallen world. So Jesus looked to the kingdom that he would rule, and he endured the cross in the meantime uh, and despised the shame, knowing that he had greater things coming. So we have greater things coming too, and we need to keep that focus as we deal with this temporary fallen world, and I do mean temporary. Where did I leave off? Oh, verse 10, and you, O Lord, or you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands, Genesis 1. They will perish, but you remain, so a temporary world. They will all become like an old garment, like a mantle, you will roll them up like a garment, they will also be changed. But you are the same and your years will not come to an end. So you get to Hebrews 13, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the Lord remains faithful and constant through it all, and he has no end. His years don't come to an end. But to which of the angels has he the Father ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet? Answer, none. He said it to not an angel, but his son Jesus Christ in Psalm 110 compared to many New Testament passages. And then he says of angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? That's what angels do. They minister to us who will inherit the kingdom. So no matter the exact identification and interpretation of the description of the 24 elders and the four living creatures with all its complexity, and by the way, it's challenged some of the most seasoned Bible interpreters, Our passage clearly demonstrates that there's an incredible supernatural supernatural realm beyond us that we cannot see, and there's a wonderful abode of God as believers we will one day enter. So Revelation 4, 9 through 11 gives a picture of continuous worship of everything in heaven, which we're going to see more of next time. So speaking of heaven, how do you qualify to enter heaven? If somebody says, I'm not sure about any of this, I've never thought about Jesus Christ, I've heard of him. Well, the Bible's clear, all people are born into this world dead in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22a says, in Adam all die. 
We have come into this world spiritually separated from God with no power in and of ourselves to rectify that horrible dilemma. But the second part of 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, but in Christ, all will be made alive. So what does that mean? Well, Christ died on the cross, went to the grave, rose from the dead. He is alive and well. If you believe in him, you will be made alive in him. So to be more specific, we know that God the Father sent his only son in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus walked the earth in the power of the Spirit, representing God to Israel, offering the kingdom to Israel. Um, Many other things he did in his incarnation, but a central thing he did at the end of his three-year ministry. He went to a cross and did something, well, the commonality with going to the cross with many others is that he died on two pieces of timber. Like a common criminal, the Romans crucified hundreds of thousands of people uh, for the penalty of violating the Roman Empire. However, Jesus was without sin. So like, like a common criminal, which he was not, he is sent to crucifixion by the Roman governor Pilate. And Jesus hangs on that cross for six hours total, from nine in the morning till three in the afternoon. The first three hours, he's receiving the wrath of man, because who's around the cross hurling insults at him? If he's the son of God, let him come down and save himself. All of a sudden, right at noon, the Bible says it got dark at noon and midday. Uh, It doesn't happen, right? So supernatural darkness covers that hill for three hours. Reminds me of the supernatural darkness that covered Egypt for three hours, for three days. Remember three days and nights? For a total of three days, no one in Egypt had light except God's people had light in their dwellings. So why God in that darkness was judging those people? Well, now God's going to judge his own son in our place to take our sin that we deserve that judgment. His own son will do it, the sinless son of God. 1 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin, Jesus, was made sin for us, the cross, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So if He is righteous, when I believe the gospel, that He died on the cross for my sins, was buried and raised on the third day, I am now in Him. If He's perfectly righteous, what are you? The righteousness of God in Him. So God imputes perfect righteousness to your account, the second you believe in Christ. So how many of you are as equally righteous in your standing with the righteous Christ? Now, how's your walk? Don't talk to me about that in front of everybody, right? We all sin. We fall short of the glory of God. Even in our walk, we don't walk perfectly. But in our position, we share the righteousness of Christ because it's been imputed to us. Find one religion on the planet that has that. None of them do. They all have this, well, i got to work my way to God and be as good as I can and hope for the best. So the gospel is clear. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Jesus died on the cross according to the scriptures, died for our sins. He was buried and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 24, right here on the slide. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross so that having died to sin, sins literally, We might live for righteousness, for by his wound, it's actually singular in the Greek, by his wound we were healed. I think the wound is the cross. So he died for us as our substitute, bore all the sins of all men. So that's what he did. But what do we do to receive the free gift? John 3, 16, one thing. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And anyone at that moment they ever made that decision, or if you make it today, God will commit to you eternally. We are eternally secure. Jesus said, you are my sheep. I give you eternal life. You will never perish forever, and no one can pluck you out of my hand. So we're in good hands. We're in the hands of the Father, the hands of the Son, and sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. So the Trinity holds us. I like that. Because if it's up to me, I'm in trouble, right? You are too. Not if it's up to me. I'd let you in, but... uh, (laughs) We all sin, so we say, wait a minute, I can't be up to me. It's got to be up to the Lord who provided the salvation. So he holds us until we meet him, but it does matter how we live until we meet him. There's a reason why we're still here. We're here to represent him and follow him and obey him and bring glory to him um, as much as we can throughout our day. So we're going to pause here. I know it's only 11.15, but we'll see you next week for continued worship in Revelation 4. Father in heaven,
we thank you so much for our time to gather here to, today and worship you and get our minds off of the day-to-day. Uh, some of it isn't good that we see, and then there are just some things in the day-to-day we just need a break from. Um, so we thank you for our employment, our jobs, the things that you provide for us uh, outside of church. We praise you for it. We thank you for the food we had today and all this week. We thank you for the shelter that you provided for us, the water that we drink. All these things you give us, we often take for granted. We thank you most of all for the spiritual things. We thank you for your son who gave us eternal life. We thank you for the spiritual life that he allows us to walk. We thank you for all the spiritual assets we have to execute this supernatural walk. We thank you for the coming resurrection that's short of come at the rapture of the church when Jesus returns for us and puts us in glorified bodies. So Lord, we praise you today, tomorrow, and forever. In Christ we pray, amen.